Okay, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome. Um, good morning or good evening, um, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, a warm welcome to our 11th webinar in the local and subnational government information webinar series. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all join us today. Uh, we've got quite an impressive turnout today and also a very impressive panel. Um, so just a, a welcome from myself. I'll introduce myself in a little bit. Um, but uh, just to run through a few logistics of the webinar, uh, this webinar will be recorded uh, and the recording will be made available um, to all those who have registered um, and will also be put on YouTube uh, for future reference. Um, we will also provide any details um, or documents that are mentioned throughout the webinar uh, in a follow-up email to those who have registered. Uh, just to note that we have a few presentations to uh, cover this morning. Um, after the presentations are done, we will open the floor and provide an opportunity for some questions and discussion. And at that point, there are a few ways that you can ask questions, and that's either by raising your hand using the panel on the right or by making use of the chat box. Um, but we ask that you, you keep your questions until the end when we open uh, it to the floor. So, Again, thank you for joining us. And today we are going to, we have an exciting program. We're going to be looking at uh, some reflections on the plan of action on subnational government cities and other local authorities for biodiversity. Uh, and this plan of action was in effect from 2011 to 2020. Um, and we are going to be looking at some of the recommendations for a renewed plan of action that have come out of a, a review of uh, the current plan. Um, and then we're really excited um, to, to be covering the, the Edinburgh process and the Edinburgh Declaration, um, and there'll be more on that uh, later. So this webinar will feature Ingrid Kutzia, who is no uh, stranger to these webinars, um, as well as Kobe Brandt, um, and they are both based uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, in our Ikli Cities Biodiversity Centre. Um, also no stranger to the webinars is Mr. Oliver Hillel from the SCBD, um, he's unable to join us uh, in this session live, but we do have a pre-recording of his, um, and he will join us live in this afternoon session. Um, and then we're really excited to have a representative from the Scottish government. Um, John is joining us, um, and John will speak to us about the uh, upcoming Edinburgh process, the online and virtual consultation process um, that will, will take place shortly. So this is just a snapshot. Um, of where we are and highlighting how 2020 is really a critical year, uh, both uh, in the global uh, agenda and program, but also specifically for our local and subnational government constituency. Um, and this is uh, an introduction to uh, myself and our panelists. So my name is Timothy Blatch. I'm a professional officer at ICLE Africa and the global coordinator for the Cities with Nature Partnership Initiative. Um, I've already mentioned uh, our panelists, but we have Kobe Brandt, who's the Regional Director of ICLE Africa and also the Global Director of ICLE City Biodiversity Centre. Uh, we also have Ingrid, who's Senior Manager of Biodiversity and Nature-Based Solutions um, in ICLE City's Biodiversity Centre. Uh, Mr. Oliver Hillel from uh, the SCBD and also John Murray from um, the Scottish Government. Um, and John is an International Marine Biodiversity Policy Manager and is uh, part of the team that we are working very closely with um, in, in designing and implementing the Edinburgh process that we will hear uh, more about. So a warm welcome to our panelists. Uh, it's wonderful to have you all on the line and thank you for uh, making uh, your inputs and contributions. Um, so this webinar is on behalf of uh, the Global Task Force for which ICLE is the focal point uh, to the three Rio conventions. Um, and in this case, we'll be focusing on the, the CBD. Um, and just to note, this just situates the webinar within our uh, annual program of webinars. Uh, this is our 11th webinar in the series, but the third uh, webinar for this year. Um, and you, uh, when you receive this presentation after the webinar, you will be able to follow the links to register for upcoming webinars, um, our next one being on the 14th of May. Um, so just quickly, the agenda for today, I've covered the introduction and welcome and opening. Uh, Ingrid is going to provide a brief update on the roadmap and the changes to the timeline of events uh, due to COVID-19. 
as you can imagine, these dates are in constant flux and change, so we'll have a, a brief update on that. Uh, before Kobe will uh, present some uh, of our key ICLI messaging on COVID-19 uh, and also give some feedback from a, a World Urban Parks Roundtable, um, which ICLI and uh, a few other partners are, are co-developing. Uh, thereafter, we'll have a brief uh, pre-recorded presentation from Oliver introducing the plan of action um, and providing a bit of history to that before Ingrid presents on the review of the current plan of action and some of the, the draft recommendations uh, for a renewed and stepped up plan of action. And, and this plan of action work is, is critical to the Edinburgh process, um, which John will uh, go through in detail. Uh, uh, for us and will highlight uh, how the process will work and how we will engage uh, virtually in the consultation. Thereafter, I've mentioned we will open for questions and discussions um, if there's any um, any inputs to be made from the floor to any of our panelists. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ingrid um, and Ingrid will provide an update on the roadmap uh, and changes to the timeline. So thanks Ingrid, over to you. Thank you, Tim, and hello to all the participants. Um, so just on to the, the timeline, um, or, or specifically the, the roadmap towards uh, COP15, um, I think the important thing, as we've mentioned in the past, is that things are very fluid at the moment. We're having to be very adaptable to the unfolding spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has meant that um, the dates of a lot of these events, in fact, all of them have had to be postponed. Some of them have had new dates confirmed. Some of them are still to be confirmed. Um, and just very quickly, you can see the red star where we are at the moment. Uh, the forthcoming event that we're all excited about is the Edinburgh process. And I'm not going to say more about that because John will elaborate. But then moving forward, um, I think the important thing is just to note that the uh, subsidiary body on scientific, technical and technological advice um, has been shifted forward, um, further back and it's going to be taking place now towards the end of August from the 17th to the 22nd of August. Um, that's just to the, the big green dot on the below the dotted line. And uh, if you look above it, you'll see the SBI-3, that's the subsidiary body on implementation meeting, which is taking place the week after that, from the 24th to the 29th of August. And these are important uh, meetings in the CBD process uh, calendar. Um, as they are uh, the key events in terms of uh, taking the negotiations on the new global biodiversity framework forward, the one being technical and the other one being more focused on implementation. Um, you'll see to the right of the SBI uh, dot, uh, there's the open-ended working group three, which is also very critical in terms of the actual negotiation process. This meeting is scheduled to take place in Kali, but uh, as a result of the moving on of the SBI 3 and the SABSTA meetings, the final date has not yet been confirmed. Uh, it was going to take place in July. It has to take place after the SBI 3 meeting. And as soon as there is a notification from the Secretariat on the convention, uh, we will um, make that date available to people as well. The next big date, um, on the calendar uh, is a small dot at the bottom to the right of the EPSTA meeting. That's the United Nations General Assembly uh, Summit on Biodiversity, uh, which is a high level meeting. It's um, targeted at heads of state and government. This is going to be taking place on the 22nd of September in New York. And the theme of this meeting is urgent action on biodiversity for sustainable development. And this particular gathering, this summit, provides a unique opportunity to demonstrate ambitions towards accelerating action on biodiversity. And it's a very important milestone in creating and giving momentum to the negotiations around the new global biodiversity framework, which will be adopted at COP15. Um, and while I mentioned COP15, um, the date for this has not yet been confirmed. Uh, what we do know is that it will not be taking place at the end of this year. It will be taking place in next year. Um, the, the venue will still remain the same. It's still taking place in um, Kunming in China. Um, and 
basically um, the, I, the sort of uh, general feeling is that it'll probably take place not early part of next year, but sometime around between April, uh, June, July. Uh, but that confirmation we are waiting still for as well. There are some other meetings as well that are not uh, specifically uh, CBD related uh, events, but they are important nevertheless. Uh, one being the IUCN uh, World Conservation Congress, uh, which was going to be taking place uh, in May uh, this year. It has been moved now and will take place early next year from the 7th to the 15th of January, and it is still scheduled to take place in Marseille in France. Um, and then uh, ICLI also has a very important event, uh, specifically uh, or more specifically focused on climate. That is the Daring Cities um, event, uh, which was scheduled for, for June of this year, and that has also been moved further back. Um, at the moment, the um, idea is to be holding it in October. Final dates will still be made available. Um, and the idea is that the format of this particular meeting will also uh, change a little bit uh, in the sense that we're looking at a longer period of time and a combination of different types of, of gathering. Some may be online, some may be very small, very focused, high-level uh, meetings. Um, and as soon as the planning around this has been finalized, uh, we will make uh, information on that available as well. And then what is not on this timeline, but are very, very important, are the two um, days coming up shortly. The one is uh, the Biodiversity Day, which will take place on the 22nd of May, and it is coordinated by the, the, the Secretariat of the CBD. Um, and the, the theme for this is uh, this year is Our Solutions Are in Nature, which is very pertinent given the times that we live in. And this theme specifically responds to the pandemic, and the idea is that the global community will um, reflect and uh, um, communicate and um, make available information on how we can re-examine our relationship with the natural world, given um, the pandemic and the sorts of situations we're finding ourselves in. And I think another important message coming from uh, this uh, information on biodiversity day that's being sent out is the need for working together at all levels for the um, future of life in harmony with nature. So um, we're expecting some really interesting um, notices and events to come forward on that. Um, and we're working very closely with the city of Montreal. And some of you may know that uh, the mayor of Montreal, Mayor Valerie Plant, is ICLE's global ambassador for local biodiversity. And we're working with her office around what sort of communication messages and um, initiatives will be launched um, or will be held on Biodiversity Day to celebrate that. As soon as we have details, they will also be made available through our usual media channel, um, canals and um, platforms. And um, I'm just encouraging everybody to keep an eye open for this because there's some exciting things in the pipeline. And then another very important um, world event is the World Environment Day, um, which is organized by UNEP. And this year also, because 2020 is such an important year for biodiversity, the theme is on biodiversity. And I just want to share with you that um, Colombia is the global host of uh, World Environment Day 2020. Um, and then again, we are working with uh, the city of Montreal because they've been designated as the North American capital uh, for World Environment Day this year. And there are some really exciting communication uh, initiatives that um, the city is planning, and we will be uh, making more information about that available as soon as the um, plans are finalized. One of the reasons why um, we're not making these available at the moment is obviously because um, the city, um, and in fact, everybody that's involved in the organization of these events is having to take cognizance and um, of the, the specific pandemic um, situations in the cities and the countries that are affected. And um, so, as I said earlier, these things are quite fluid. And um, the, as soon as it's possible, uh, the information around specific events will then be made, uh, made known. 
just one small little thing about the World uh, Environment Day, especially for our participants that work in cities. Um, UNEP is working on a city toolkit, uh, specifically around the theme this year. Um, and I understand um, that this toolkit will be available um, Wednesday next week. And then we will also, um, through our usual um, channels and, and mechanisms, we will make information and links to those toolkits available. Tim, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. I've finished basically with the, the update on where we stand with um, the, the timeframes and the roadmap. And um, as I said, we will keep people informed as things become more certain. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, thank you for uh, giving us a, an update on that. Um, as Ingrid has mentioned, we continue to update this uh, timeline on an ongoing basis and continue to share uh, any updates that come on the constant uh, changes that are taking place. Um, so without further ado, and in the interest of time, I've already introduced Kobi, um, and many of you will know her, and uh, Kobi is going to uh, be discussing uh, our ICLI messaging around COVID-19 and also provide some feedback on a very exciting roundtable um, that recently took place, uh, which ICLI, part ICLI Cities Biodiversity Centre participated in, uh, along with a range of other partners. So, Kobi, thank you for joining us, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and a good day to everybody joining us. Um, Ingrid, thank you very much for that overview. Let me just add, before I go into this uh, next slide, um, that uh, to the timetable, we should really also bear in mind that um, the biodiversity advocacy processes and leading processes up to COP15 are not happening in isolation. And uh, we are also very uh, working very closely with, uh, for instance, the processes of the other Rio conventions. The probably the most pertinent one is um, the climate uh, UNFCCC convention uh, COPS, and um, uh, we can also say there that um, yesterday we held a webinar, and those who are interested to receive uh, the slide deck of that webinar are welcome to contact uh, Tim and we can arrange that for you. Our global advocacy head, Yunus Arakan, leads those webinars and he uh, shared with uh, the participants that practically um, all those dates are also moving out and it's becoming very likely, it's definite now that the Climate COP, which is an annual event, will not take place this year as planned. It's becoming very clear that it will take place next year and most likely quite late next year. Um, moving on the, for the COPs to follow, also with a year later. So we can see that COVID-19 is really um, changing global agendas and um, it's got a global impact in so many ways, but also in terms of global advocacy processes around climate, biodiversity, sustainable development and many others. It's also adjusting the way we work and live and play. And here, if we can move to the next slide, um, I would like to remind you that um, um, we have seen a new phenomenon here around the world where people are not always able to get outdoors. Many of us, including all of us here in South Africa, are under lockdown. Um, and there are various um, variations of lockdowns around the world currently in place. Uh, in some, some parts of the world, parks are still accessible to people and green open spaces to enjoy, obviously with social dis uh, distance measures, etc. But um, that's not for everyone. And um, on the initiative of the World Urban Parks um, um, partners who work very closely with us and others, um, we held some two weeks ago already our first round table event um, uh, around the issues around access to open spaces and the need for access to nature during pandemics like what we're facing now and during hardship. Um, and uh, I think the panel unanimously agreed that it's at times like this when we are 
almost deprived of that day-to-day -day engagement with nature that many people actually realize anew how important uh, the human uh, humankind's connection with nature is and that was reinforced in the discussions so um, the hashtag that uh, we'll be using as going as a collaborative going forward around the need for open spaces the need for parks and safe recreation opportunities outdoors in parks is that nature never closes and that you'll see that you would have seen in the previous slide hashtag nature never closes so um the uh international parks expert round table basically was um uh, came up came out with key recommendations and key messages that we want to take further um and uh, basically, uh, you, you'll see the partners there. Uh, what we want to achieve is to provide expert guidance from within our network. And those who want to join and be part of this initiative, please also do reach to us. It's not a closed group. Um, provide uh, expert guidance regarding parks and nature during very significant times, moments like this when we have a public health crisis affecting the whole world and um, the panel also aims to raise awareness of the benefits of using public spaces in cities especially urban parks but not limited to parks only um, and then the need to connect nature during the COVID-19 pandemic um, connect as many people as possible to nature in as many ways as possible if it can't be physical then um, you know look at virtual options we can move to the next slide which just quickly shows the partners um, we are very happy to be working with with all of these partners who we work with very closely anyway under our umbrella initiative called cities with nature um, and nature for all the national park city foundation world urban Parks, Salzburg Global Seminar, uh, the National Recreation and Parks Association of the US. Um, Nature Fall, of course, is, is an initiative of ICN. Um, you know, they're all coming together and we all sort of cal calibrated our messaging. In the next slide, you will see that um, um, our, we have agreed um, that we'll be working together to achieve a joint vision. And um, the uh, provide some leadership and collaboration linking basically health and well-being to na to nature and making sure that that message is heard and that it lands with those policy makers uh, during the pandemic which may be with us for a long time still and then afterwards as well in a recovery phase that we do not forget about building and rebuilding and shaping our cities in a way that allows people to connect to nature in big and small ways. Um, our vision, um, the, there's a need to create amongst ourselves a clear shared vision um, that is positive and proactive with regards to uh, the future of cities and also emphasizes the, the tremendous um, uh, role that cities can play in connecting people with nature and that vital connect it has uh, been spoken of but it's not only in terms of connecting people with nature for people's sake but also for nature's sake and we believe that many parks have been instrumental to actually ensure that biodiversity thrives in cities we've seen many cities where wildlife has in fact come back um, responding positive to large scale open green spaces etc in our cities we will also be sharing knowledge with other experts and amongst ourselves um, embark on collective campaigns share interdisciplinary material build case studies etc and then communicate um, very clear positive and time sensitive messaging around the importance of nature and urban parks in times of crisis and uh, please watch out for the upcoming uh, global parks week where a lot of um, 
a lot of these will come through. So we can skip to the next slide um, and really actually also skip along to the to the next one where um, ICLE um, has like all city networks and other subnational networks a clear strategy of how we support up our support really and engage in new ways of supporting collectively our cities and our subnational governments around COVID-19. There's a great need for our community of cities to connect during these times. And um, from our side, our key messages are really around very keeping it very simple but keeping very clear messages around the need for building urban resilience and that it's now more critical than ever um, and it's not only about health but it's also about welfare the softer side of things are very important in terms of physical mental spiritual and community welfare and their nature can play a massive a positive role. Um, the need to protect and respect nature. We've seen a lot of protection of nature, but um, are we still respecting it the way we should be in what we eat, in how we engage with it, in how we interact with it? And again there, um, this is now broader than just our work with the World Urban Parks and partners around parks, but it's broadly speaking about the integrity and the need for the integrity of our ecosystems. And then very simply, nature is good for you in many ways. I'm not going to dwell on that, but yes, whether you're indoors or outdoors, uh, connecting with nature in whichever way you can during times of stress, that's actually good for you physically, and that's been proven. Um, and we do encourage cities to rethink their policies about uh, where possible um, that they keep parks open and they keep recreation opportunities open for people to still connect and have that recreational benefit of being outdoors and being with nature. And then uh, connect online. And this can really actually move us to the next slide because we, we have a program called Cities with Nature, which is a collaborative, very large collaborative effort of many partners. And if there are partners on board in this webinar who are not yet part of Cities with Nature, please reach to us, cities or partners. This is a collaborative effort um, which uh, enables cities to connect with those in the space um, digitally, online, um, and um, demonstrate um, innovative ways of what cities are doing and what cities can be doing, learning from each other, sharing knowledge, sharing initiatives and inspiring each other to action, but also commit and report their actions on this platform. So it offers a space for collective action, raising ambition and um, growing a virtual community, which I think we're going to see much more of, of these virtual communities. Um, of cities and others connecting in such ways. So in a way, we have seen that during, uh, during COVID-19, more cities are actually joining cities with nature right now in these very days. So we have seen in a way that a concept like cities with nature is is a, the, a way to go into the future, where people are probably going to want to be more connected online and perhaps um, yeah, strengthen those systems and perhaps even travel less in future to get together. So there's a lot of information, a lot of very innovative things. One of the things that we're doing, and I'm closing off with this, is that Cities with Nature will soon be um, embarking on building a pathway with of many partners on board already around how cities can mainstream nature for health and well-being, making that vital connect between health, well-being, the urban world that we all live in or that the majority of us live in, and then um, nature and the multiple benefits of planning and shaping cities with nature into the future. So join us in Cities with Nature and thank you very much, Tim, for organizing this webinar. I'll end here. Great, thank you, Kobe, and thank you for those inputs. Um, uh, definitely in these uncertain times, um, uh, our connection with nature is really brought to the fore. 
Um, so thank you for highlighting also um, the need for digitalization um, and Cities with Nature certainly provides a, an opportunity to do that. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on quite quickly and we are uh, it's great to have Oliver with us virtually. Um, he will be joining this afternoon session live, uh, but we have a short recording um, from him that he's kindly provided um, to give us a bit of a, an introduction and background to the, the current plan of action before Ingrid speaks to the uh, review. So I'm hoping that technology will allow us. Contributing to this webinar, my name is Oliver Hillel, and I represent the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'd like to begin by bringing us back to uh, 2007, uh, when uh, there was, for the first time, a, a meeting that focused on cities and biodiversity in the convention that came at the initiative of the mayor of Curitiba, who had uh, hosted just a year before the conference. So through the initiative of the mayor with Clay, the first meeting on cities and biodiversity was uh, produced in 2007. That and became a parallel meeting in Bonn at the next conference of the meeting, of the parties and over time that became a proposal for a plan of action that was going to be run parallel to the strategic plan to the 2011-2020 strategic plan so it was done so the the decision 1022 uh which was adopted um in in nagoya in japan at cop 10 adopted a plan of action that was going to go parallel to the strategic plan and so it went. So if we want, there was a lot of progress over those last 10 years. Uh, more than 50% of the national reports and the national biodiversity and strategy and action plans that we have today in the convention include mention to the role of subnational and local government. And in, in fact, I think the percentage is much higher. It's that some of those plans are still from some time ago. Most of the programs of work, most of the Aichi biodiversity targets had particular contribution from subnational and local governments, many of them led by ECLE as well as uh, Regions 4. So we've had a whole progress in that. And I think now the point, if you want, is to imagine now that the parties are considering uh, a new global biodiversity for a framework that will not only uh, apply to the 10 years after the, the conference of the parties of the, the 15th that's coming up probably in the first half of 2021 in, in Kunming in China, the, the text of that framework will not apply only for the 10 years, it will apply all the way to the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. So this is the value of an additional complement. The framework itself already contains a lot of um, opportunities for contributions. It is, you, you cannot think of without the government. Today, it's a reality of part and part. However, the point that should be is how can a strong constituency national their own proposals to the in how can we first of all make sure that the 20 targets that are being discussed in this framework and particularly uh, target 10 which already requests every one of the parties to bring the benefits and services of nature and protected areas and green areas straight to urban citizens. So there is already a requirement to bring nature into cities very clearly on target 10. But other than that, every one of those 20 targets has a reflection on the contribution of local and subnational governments. So I think looking at that framework, the decision that will adopt a complementary plan of action that or some kind of role, some kind of form thing for the role of subnational government that goes along. It could be a plan of action. It could be something even more interactive with the framework. That will be up to this discussion to imagine. So basically, that's the added 
value. It is that the framework will stand as a commitment from parties and all players. And this decision, this review of the plan of action and the new recommendations would stand as an additional tool to complement where necessary with the requirements of local and subnational governments. Um, I would like to, to say also that the decision should not be just a plan of action. We need to think also this discussion should cover what, um, what exact format a new and stronger cooperation between national, subnational, and local governments in parties, in every one of the parties, what should it look like? Should we, for instance, imagine that the next uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plans be actually conceived as being made of parts of subnational government in federative uh, or in national governments association? That was the, the, the UK's proposal, for instance, was that every one of the governments does their own strategy and that the global UK strategy is composed of the harmonized imbrication of all of those strategies, maybe something like that. Maybe we should have a working group that permanently oversees the implementation and the execution of that plan of action that is going to be discussed. So it's not just the document. It needs to be how we perceive the cooperation, uh, the harmonization between all levels of governance because um, that may be the concluding point. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how important local and subnational governments are. Uh, we have seen all over the world the, the tremendous importance of national, subnational, and city governments speaking the same language in coordinating efforts. The same applies for the role of nature in the recovery uh, after the recession and the depression that we are currently experiencing. So we need to think when we reactivate the machinery of the economy and of political decisions, we need to think that what you are discussing now needs to be how subnational and local governments will help to make nature a part of the solution. Thank you for your attention. Great. So a huge thank you to Oliver uh, for making uh, his inputs available to us even in this session that he was unable to join live um, and i think that's provided a very useful introduction um, an overview and history to the plan of action um, as a, a complementary to uh, to the the previous strategic plan and uh, that i think opens the way perfectly for what ingrid is going to present on now which is around the review of the current plan of action and recommendations for a renewed stepped up plan of action. Um, so Ingrid, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask you to be as brief as possible, um, but over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And if you can move on to the next slide, Tim. So just to say um, that ICLE has uh, started uh, work some time ago on reviewing the current plan of action to see what worked, what didn't work, what its strengths and weaknesses were, but also to focus specifically on the achievements. Um, because in looking back and looking at what worked and what the achievements were, it does build a very compelling case for um, the fact that we need to have uh, another instrument, whether as, as um, Oliver alluded, whether it should be a plan of action or something maybe more interactive uh, and more ambitious, that is uh, for the negotiations uh, still to, to um, decide. But the fact is that we need city governments, we need other levels of subnational government because they are where the rubber hits the road. They are the most directly affected but also the most directly in tune with what happens on the ground and what the needs are of people and how the impacts of, of nature are felt in, in our day-to-day -day lives. So if you can move on to the next slide. Um, some of the really um, amazing things has been in reflecting back and looking what has happened as the past 10 years, um, either directly or indirectly as a result of the current plan of action, it has been incredible to see the wide diversity and the scope of things that have happened, initiatives that have been taken place, new programs, research programs, new institutions that were created. 
the development of platforms such as Cities with Nature, but there are also other uh, platforms, um, for example, the World Bank's uh, global uh, platform on sustainable cities, which has also brought in the whole concept of biodiversity and nature within the urban context. There's been funding um, facilities that have mobilized around specifically nature and cities, and I'm thinking of the GEF and the IKI funding. There's been a host of guidelines um, and more exciting also has been the fact that this emphasis on cities and the contribution that cities can make and other levels of sub-national government has given rise to new approaches, to new methodologies, um, to the, uh, the real coming of its own of uh, nature-based solutions, because we see how cities um, in very practical ways are applying these solutions to deal with basic service issues, challenges around infrastructure. Uh, we're seeing, for example, that increasingly cities are realizing how valuable uh, green and blue infrastructure is and what the cost uh, implications and the benefits are of these and the fact that nature has a whole range of services through ecosystems that if well functioning um, and are healthy can really contribute to the quality of life, but also importantly, the resilience of cities. So building against this, Slim, you can move to the next slide. What we're seeing is that there is a very compelling case to have a very strong decision, much stronger than the decisions of the past. And we're very grateful that through the past um, decade and the, and the success of COPs, there have been an increasing number of decisions that recognize the role of cities. But we need to move forward beyond just promoting this or recognizing it. We need to actually institutionalize and operationalize this role that uh, the, the, all levels of sub-national governments can play. If you move on, um, so what has come out, and this is now looking forward, um, some of the elements of what uh, could come in the new dedicated decision that, that Oliver was referring to and that we in ICLEI have been calling for uh, through the comments that we've made um, in the CBD negotiation process, but also specifically in the 10-point framework that we've developed, is really looking at some key elements or aspects. And the one, obviously, is the issue of how do we incalculate and embed local and sub-national governments' contributions, not as other actors or stakeholders, but as an integral part of the machinery of government. Local and sub-national governments have, have mandated powers and functions. They are part of government, and they need to be brought into setting of targets, realizing of targets, monitoring targets, etc across the whole spectrum of what the global biodiversity framework provides for. Um, the issue of the mobilization and distribution of resources is very important. We need to find mechanisms and enabling conditions to support that, not just from the public sector, but specifically also the private sector. Um, I think the point about um, supporting better decision-making, access to data, better monitoring, using existing platforms and systems that we do have to make that link the bridging between what happens at the ground level versus what is set as policy at the national level to contribute to national stand, uh, uh, targets and the global um, objectives. Those things need to be strengthened. Um, one of the ways that we are looking at is how mainstreaming biodiversity, which is an important part of the new global biodiversity framework, how that really comes to its own at the local level of government and at the sub-national level. And it's not just a thing that needs a sectoral approach, it needs a multi-level or vertical approach as well. Um, obviously, capacity building is very important. There are backlogs, there are gaps, there is a need for building capacity. And one of the things that I think going forward is going to be increasingly important is the issue of digital capacity. Um, and then, of course, cities and local authorities and sub-national governments can play a huge role in educating and raising awareness of communities in terms of how we use our resources, how we consume, what we produce. We eat in cities. The waste that's generated in cities affects not only our own environments, but also the downstream environments. And these, so these are some of the uh, key elements that we're wanting to see. The format, whether it's going to be a plan of action, whether there'll be a program of work, 
whether it is a, a whole new mechanism, those details are things that are that still need to be discussed. But I think the fundamental principles are there, and it has to be a much stronger um, type of, of uh, a decision. It cannot just be a recognizing or promoting. It needs to be very clear in terms of what the targets are and what the um, actions will be. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ingrid. And I note your final point, um, which was around some next steps, um, and that leads quite nicely into our next um, panelist. Um, and John, we are so grateful to have you join us today and to give us an overview of the Edinburgh process and an introduction to the Edinburgh Declaration. And also just to note that this will also be the process or mechanism through which we get inputs on those uh, the review that Ingrid has uh, just presented. So. John, without further ado, um, thank you for joining us. We're really grateful to have you uh, with us and over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to talk today. Um, if we could just move on to the next slide. Um, so as uh, Tim has introduced, my name is uh, John Mote, uh, and I work for the Scottish Government uh, here in Edinburgh, um, working on international biodiversity policy. And I'm just in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, going to run through uh, the Edinburgh process, um, what that is, what we're planning over the next uh, couple of months, and, and leading right up to COP15. So the Edinburgh process came about uh, from a commitment made by the Scottish Government um, uh, early last year um, to take forward a workshop um, as part of the open-ended working group process of the, of the CBD to, to hold a workshop on subnational governments and to gather their input on um, the post-2020 biodiversity uh, framework. Um, within the UK, uh, Scotland has devolved responsibility as a subnational government for leading on biodiversity and we take that role very seriously and we want to lead not only within the UK but uh, globally on that process. So. Our original aim of that uh, Edinburgh workshop was to host a, a three-day physical workshop uh, in Edinburgh at the Royal Botanic Gardens um, and to bring representatives of sub-national local government from all of the various uh, UN geographical areas together to discuss the zero draft, um, to discuss some more of the details and themes around that uh, and to gather their views uh, within that three days. Uh, unfortunately, like everybody else, we're, we're struggling to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I, I consider myself quite lucky. Uh, at least I can still get out once a day to enjoy some exercise in the park and enjoy a little bit of nature, even with the social distancing, which I think is uh, more than some people are allowed to at the moment. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm grateful for that. Um, so. Over, I think early in the year, we realized that it was not going to be possible to host that physical workshop. And since then, we've been working to try and see how we can change that workshop into a more online virtual process that will still allow subnational local governments to contribute, um, but will be able to capture the information in a different way. So we have decided to move to a more a traditional online consultation. Um, but that will be backed up with a series of regional information sessions, uh, some follow-up sessions after the consultation is closed, and, and a series of more thematic webinars that will run through the process. And I will come on to those all in a little bit more detail uh, through the presentation. Um, of course, uh, although in Scotland we're, we're Leaning on this, we're not doing it alone, and we can really only take this forward with the, the great support of the Edinburgh Process Partners, of which ICLEI, of course, is one of the key partners that are helping us shape the Edinburgh Process, produce some of the content, think through how we can do it, and, and reach out uh, through your, your network to um, uh, local and subnational governments to, put, to participate. Um, of course, we're also working with other regional organizations such as Regions 4, Goals, the European Committee of the Regions, um, also with some of our other subnational partners such as Quebec and the Welsh Government and a range of other uh, support organizations. And it's really a collaborative effort to try and ensure that we can um, gather the subnational local input to the, the post-2020 framework. Um, if you could move on to the next slide, please. 
So the, the, the Edinburgh process um, as it is now uh, has really has, um, I suppose, four aims. The first is really to do the consultation to gather the views of subnational governments on um, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the zero draft that's been discussed in, in various open-ended working group meetings at the moment. Um, and what will happen is following that consultation and online sessions that we will develop an Edinburgh process report which will gather the global views um, of, of subnational governments on the, the framework. That will then be submitted back through to the CBD so that state parties can take it into account. Um, we've already heard about the update of the subnational action plan and we're really happy that ICLE is leading on that and that we can help um, uh, facilitate a consultation on that through the, uh, the Edinburgh process um, so that we can gather the views of subnational governments. And then the third uh, product, which the, we hope, obviously hope to produce at the workshop itself, but we're now doing online, is to develop an Edinburgh declaration, which will capture the high level political views of subnational local governments. And I think even sitting here listening to today to some of the discussions that are going on about how things are changing with the COVID-19 pandemic, I think even now there will be need to be changes to that Edinburgh Declaration to really reflect how we recover after the, the pandemic is over and how we really make sure that nature is at the forefront of that recovery um, when we do start to move back to um, uh, a semblance of normality in our lives. And then finally, the objective is really to create uh, an Edinburgh process community through the partners, but all through, through the wider um, uh, participants that will take part over the next couple of months. Um, and we hope to do that through various technology platforms such as Attendify to really bring everybody together and not just for the Edinburgh process, but right up until the COP. So building support um, along with ICLE for the subnational plan of action, getting the declaration signed and, and shared with state parties to really push the view that Ingrid has already, I think, quite well put forward that uh, subnational and local governments are really need to be integrated into the implementation of this and not just considered another stakeholder, but really an integral part of how we implement the, the global uh, biodiversity framework for the next 10 years. Um, so, I just want to highlight the timeline of the process. This is, of course, a provisional timeline. Um, as, as with everything at the moment, it's a bit of a moving feast in terms of when meetings are, how we can progress. Um, we also have challenges in terms of getting that taken forward. Um, so we are looking very shortly to open the registration process for uh, the Edinburgh process. Um, initially to those uh, subnational governments that are already submitted an expression of interest to attend the physical workshop, but there's also an opportunity for those who haven't yet done so to, to sign up and be part of the Edinburgh process as well. Um, we'll be shortly putting online the consultation documents on the zero draft and uh, the subnational plan of action, and then we'll have the first uh, group of regional information sessions which will explain the process in more detail and um, we're aiming to have four sessions so one for asia one for africa one for europe and north america and one for south america to really explain the process how people become involved to answer any questions that uh, um, participants have on the process running throughout the time period we'll have thematic webinars and i'll come back to them shortly um, and then the aim is that we'll have a month-long consultation, we'll feed back after the consultation, but then the report both on the um, Edinburgh process report and the subnational plan of action, as Ingrid mentioned, needs to go through the Substern SBI process, um, which at the moment is scheduled for the end of August and then on, on to COP15. So I think um, that's the process at the moment. These dates are provisional, but we're hoping very shortly to be able to launch that process. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the, we're also organizing at the moment a series of thematic uh, sessions to go along with the, the consultations. Uh, and these are the, the, the topics that we're 
uh, working on developing these at the moment. They'll be spread out over the process. And I think the aim is to stimulate discussion around these topics and to help people when they're thinking about responding to uh, the consultation on the zero draft. Um, and also the out, any outcomes or uh, discussions from these sessions will also be brought into the Edinburgh process report that goes back to the CBD to highlight the subnational view on these different topics and how that can be integrated into the, the zero draft before it's adopted. Um, next slide, please. So I think really, I hope that gives you an overview of what we're planning to do over the next few months uh, in line with the, the, the Edinburgh process. Um, I know some of you may already have expressed uh, an interest in participating. If you haven't, um, the email address is across the bottom of the slide here. Is it inquiries uh, subnational workshop at gov.scot? If you've not uh, indicated you want to participate, but would now, when it's a virtual rather than a physical meeting, please email that uh, and express your interest and we'll add you, to, add you to the list. And I think Tim also actually maybe sent it out with some information uh, around this webinar as well. Um, but uh, I think I'll leave it there, but I hope to engage with some of you um, through the Edinburgh process over the online meetings that we'll have. Uh, and we we'll really uh, hope that you can participate and provide your views and make sure that we clearly represent the views of subnational governments and get that views into the post-2020 process uh, and into the decisions at COP and beyond. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, John, and thanks for joining us and giving us an overview of how this exciting process will work. Um, so we encourage everyone online to please express interest and join us in that process uh, as we really tr try and pilot a, a new and innovative approach to uh, to consultation um, and to uh, participatory uh, inputs. So, th John, thank you for that overview. Um, we will continue to keep the constituency up to date with that unfolding process um, as we continue to support uh, the, the, the work of the partners. So, at this point, um, just to... to uh, show that our next webinar will take place on the 14th of May and we will distribute the links to register for that webinar uh, and we hope you will continue to join us in this exciting series um, but I'm going to open the floor now to I, I realize time is very limited we only have a few minutes but if there are any burning questions I'm going to ask my colleague Marcelo uh, to just uh, support um, with muting and unmuting anyone who has any burning questions to ask and as I've mentioned you can either raise your hand or make use of the chat box so if there's any questions please uh, feel free to ask now I see that there is a question um, on whether or not um, these webinars are open for uh, for Indian national government to attend. Um, this is a question from Rotak uh, from India, uh, a member of the Biodiversity Management Committee. Um, so, John, I'm assuming this is in reference to the webinars um, in the Edinburgh process. If you'd like to respond briefly um, to that question and who these webinars are open to. Uh, yes, thank you, Tim. Uh, no problem. Yes, the, uh, the Edinburgh process and uh, the regional online sessions that um, will be supporting it are open to, to state parties as well. And in, in the, those discussions uh, for the Edinburgh workshop, we were looking to engage with, with state parties as well, particularly those people working within state parties that have responsibility for liaising with subnational governments. Um, the idea is to have a, a, an openness process as possible to capture all those different views. I think the views of uh, of subnational governments and the state party representatives who are liaising with subnational government are, would all be welcome within that process. That's great. Thank you so much, John, for the clarity. Um, we also have a, a question from Kareen. Um, around daring cities, and maybe I'll call on Ingrid or Kobe to please uh, answer this. Um, and the question is, how will we make the link to the biodiversity agenda at uh, Daring Cities? 
All right, um, I'm happy to take that one. Um, as um, many of you know, Daring Cities is an ICLI initiative. It will be an annual event in Bonn, specifically linked to the media climate discussions that happen in Bonn at the same time, because the UNFCCC is located in Bonn. Um, but having said that, um, ICLI is expanding what was previously our annual Resilient Cities event to um, this new concept of daring cities, specifically to make more room for all five of our pathways. And nature-based development and biodiversity is one of our five cornerstone pathways of ICLI's strategic vision. So if anything, um, biodiversity and nature and everything we discuss here, um, including our advocacy process, but also showcasing and inspiring cities to take action on, on nature-based solutions, uh, green infrastructure, mainstreaming biodiversity, and of course cities with nature, all those things will, will gain more prominence in daring cities. So there will be online opportunities this year because of the situation the world finds it in at the moment, um, but there will also uh, we're looking at possibilities of having small, very high-level physical meetings at the time in Bonn. Uh, we're looking at October um, for this year's event, um, and we will have to just assess where the world is at then, whether physical meetings are recommendable or not. Um, but there'll definitely be this type of roundtable, webinars, other forms of engagement around this agenda. The idea is to really look for integrated sustainable solutions at a systemic level and mainstreaming nature and biodiversity as part of that. So definitely daring cities will have several ways that our agenda that we're talking about here today will come to the fore. Great, thank you, Kobi. Um, in, I realize we have run out of time. Just I want to recognize that it seems uh, Wendy Yap uh, has raised her hand. Wendy, are you, did you have a question? Are you able to unmute yourself or Marcelo to help us unmute? Oh, sorry, I think it was an accident. Okay, no problem, Wendy. Um, there's also another hand up. Oh no, okay. Uh, so very briefly, uh, Kobi, and I, I think you can respond to both of these questions. Firstly, we have a question, is there an office of ICLI in India? And maybe I can respond to that uh, right now off the bat, that there, there is an office in India, uh, very much so. Uh, we work closely with our colleagues there. Um, and if uh, for the, the, the details on your screen right now, if you drop us an email, we are happy to put you in touch with our office in India. And then, Kobi, there's a question around global advocacy and the importance of the upcoming G7 and G20 meetings to show how subnational governments are uh, integral parts of the machinery uh, of government. I don't know if you want to respond to that very briefly. Yeah, maybe briefly. I mean, we um, definitely, um, there is very high level engagement between our cities networks, um, mainly through the Global Task Force, uh, which ICLI is a key member of. Um, when we talk about engagement and aligning messages uh, within the G7 context, but there's a very interesting collaboration um, um, from Saudi um, around the G20 and the U20. And the U20 is made up of cities and urban experts and um, ICLI, C40, um, TNC, a number of others uh, are working um, together with our colleagues in U20 based in Riyadh um, around preparing policy papers and input into the upcoming G20 meetings later this year. And one of these aspects, um, one of these focus areas, uh, there's only three or maybe four focus areas is on nature and uh, biodiversity specifically. And ICLI is the lead technical partner of that preparatory uh, work group um, preparing for the U20 inputs into the G20 processes. So those connections are made and they're very important and they're very strategic because we really have different ways of uh, bringing um, our voices and uh, the contributions of cities uh, in the biodiversity space 
to the attention um, and for the inclusion um, of national governments through the CBD. That's one very important channel and other multi-level governance structures, but the U20, uh, the G20, sorry, and the G7 are both equally very important structures that we engage with. So yes, indeed, those links are made. We need to make them stronger. And that's also, I think, why ICLI has stepped uh, up to the invitation of leading, uh, technically leading the biodiversity inputs into the U20 G20 collaboration this year. Great, thank you, Kobe. And we've run out of time, but I'm going to give John uh, just one sentence to answer uh, the final question, and this is from Elizabeth. Um, and the the question is, how many participants are foreseen to take part in the Edinburgh process, and what type of organisations can join? So, John, if you can sum that up in one yeah. sentence that would be great so there's, there's no limit on the number of organizations that can join especially now that we're going uh, online and uh, we're looking at any subnational or local government um, representatives or organizations or networks can join um, and participate in that great thank you so much john um, so, without further ado, before we close this meeting, I just want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Oliver in absentia, um, Kobe and Ingrid from ICLI, and John from the Scottish Government. Thank you all for your time and for joining us. Uh, we encourage everyone online to uh, join us this afternoon, uh, where Oliver will be presenting live, um, and we'll be joined by John's colleague, Sue, uh, Dr. Sue Campbell, uh, who will um, present on the Edinburgh process. Um, so thank you also to all of our participants and everyone who has joined us this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and we will share more uh, details in a follow-up email, including the inquiries link for the Edinburgh process. And we encourage you again uh, to be a part of that exciting uh, process and to express your interest to stay in the loop. Um, and also our contact details are on the screen. Please contact us should you have any further uh, queries or questions. Um, but with that, a huge thank you to everyone for joining us and we look forward to uh, our next webinar on the 14th of May and we hope you will join us then. So thank you to everyone and uh, I will now close the webinar. Thank you, Tim, thank you. Thank you.